This evening, I'm honored to introduce Yoram Edinger. Yoram is a distinguished diplomat, researcher, writer, lecturer, and media commentator whose expertise spans a wide array of topics, including the United States-Israel relations, Middle East affairs, and the Iranian threat to the United States. Yoram's roots in Houston add a special dimension to his insights. He formerly served as Israel's Consul General to the southwestern United States, based here in Houston. And during his many years here, Yoram made many lifelong friends. And it's a pleasure to also welcome many of you tonight in our Bethia Shern community and throughout the greater Houston community. Yoram's career includes significant roles, such as Minister for Congressional Affairs at Israel's Embassy in Washington, D.C., where he held the rank of ambassador. <coughs> he also served is the director of Israel's government press office, managing relations with overseas journalists. In addition to his impressive diplomatic endeavors, Yoram is a prolific writer, publishing the weekly English and Hebrew brief article known as the Edinger Report. And through this platform, he analyzes topics ranging from U.S.-Israel cooperation to the impact of the Palestinian issue on U.S. interests. His academic background includes management studies at UCLA and a CPA certificate underscoring his multidisciplinary approach to complex issues. Beyond his professional accomplishments, Yoram treasures his family life. He's happily married and is the proud father and grandfather with family remaining at the heart of his motivations and inspirations. It's an honor to welcome back our friend, Yoram Edinger. Shabbat Shalom. It's a privilege to be here, and not only because my our oldest daughter went to a Jewish day school at Beit Yishurun when we were here in Houston at the Israeli consulate, but uh, because of the significance of uh, Beit Yishurun as a precept of uh, Judaism, Jewish history, Jewish religion, and Yeshurun, as you probably know, is the synonym of the name Israel. And uh, Moses, towards the end of his career, when he uh, shares with the people of Israel his legacy, he refers to the children of Yeshurun, meaning the children of, uh, of Israel. And certainly, uh, Yeshurun is very significant because uh, the root is uh, yashar, which is also both decency as well as straight. And it could be straight shooting or straight talking, as is the custom here in Texas, but also in, uh, in Israel. And in many respects, Israelis feel at home because of the straight uh, talking uh, culture in both Texas and uh, Israel. And uh, what I would like to do in the next uh, very few minutes is to share with you some of my thoughts about the impact of the current Israel-Hamas, Israel-Hezbollah war on US-Israel relations. And uh, I'll try to do it in the spirit of the Parsha of this week, which is Parsha Truma, and Truma means contribution, but again, according to the Hebrew uh, uh, acrobatics, the spelling of Truma is exactly the same as the spelling of Tumura, namely return. When you contribute, you also get something in return, and this has been the story of U.S.-Israel relations. The U.S. has invested in Israel, which you can call it also contribution, but it's basically investment. But the U.S. has benefited from a very, very high uh, ROI, a return on investment, way, way beyond any other investment made by the U.S. And we see it this very days of the war in Gaza. Uh, 
the, the CIA director, uh, Christopher Ray, just completed a visit to Israel. And the reason he came to Israel has to do with that nature of relations, the investment and the return, the contribution and the return. And the CIA director is there for one specific reason, to benefit from the lessons learned by Israel in this unprecedented urban warfare, urban warfare in general and underground urban warfare in particular. And to quote, to quote the director of the FBI, both during his visit in Israel and back on November 15th in his uh, hearing in the House Homeland Security Committee, he specifically suggested that the onslaught on Israel on October 7th could very well inspire large number of Islamic terror organizations to do the same thing against the United States, against U.S. installations throughout the globe and on the U.S. mainland. And he specifically referred to Iranian-inspired terrorism, to ISIS terrorism, Muslim Brotherhood terrorism, various types of Islamic terrorists whose goal transcends Israel, whose vision transcends Israel and has to do with bringing what they call the great American Satan to submission. Hamas happens to be a branch of the Muslim Brotherhood, which was established back in 1928 with the vision of bringing the Western infidel to submission and again zeroing in on the United States. Hezbollah in the north happens to be a proxy along with Hamas of the Ayatollahs of Iran and the Ayatollahs of Iran came to power in February of 1979 with the vision which is 1,400-year-old vision, first of all, to topple all apostate regime, and they refer to all Sunni Muslim regime as apostates, and then to take on the infidel West, and again, primarily the great American Satan. Israel is fighting its own war against Hamas and Hezbollah, but that war is in fact a major contribution to the war launched by the Western societies or the defense launched by Western societies, Western democracies against the onslaught of Islamic uh, terrorism. When it comes to this specific war, in addition to the lessons derived by the FBI director, there has been unprecedented involvement by top American military officers, most of them from the American Central Command, which is a different name for the American Middle East Military Command. They are not in Israel in order to help Israel. They are not in Israel in order to advise the Israeli generals how to conduct the war. They are in Israel, just like the FBI director, to benefit from the very <clears throat> unique experience derived by Israel in this unprecedented war. And one of the cardinal lessons has been the high degree of coordination between the Air Force, the Tank Corps, the Special Operations, and the Artillery coordination which has never achieved before, not by Israel and not by other countries. And the central command leadership is in Israel in order to study and try to apply it to American military system as well. The Americans are in Israel as part of the Air Force attempt to study from the Israeli experience. 
We haven't had any dogfight, obviously, in this war, but the intensity of Air Force, Israeli Air Force bombing, again, is unprecedented. The number of sorties by every single Israeli combat aircraft is unprecedented, and that, and that requires very high degree of repair and maintenance, and mostly, and mostly the ability to overhaul engines in the most effective and speedy way. And because of the Israeli challenge, we have achieved certain level which the Americans would like very much to benefit from. And in fact, the Americans are bringing more and more aircraft engines to Israel in order to be overhauled and benefit from, again, the Israeli expertise gained by our unique experience. And certainly, we have had some very, very unique aspect of the war by the involvement of military medics. We never had as many medics as we had before. The Israeli medics have never faced the challenge of fighting in the tunnels, which requires, again, the, the upgrading of the methods of fighting, of the methods of treating our wounded soldiers. As you probably know, many, in this case in Gaza, most warriors, fighters in Gaza are reservists. Many of them are from the high-tech industry, some of them in the medical high-tech industry, which means soldiers acquire experience in the military medical profession and they, apply, they bring it back to their own startups or other medical high-tech companies. They develop their response, which is right away applied to the battlefield. And once again, we do share it, we do share it with the Americans. There is much more to it than I just shared with you in those last few minutes. And hopefully I'll have the opportunity during dinner time to expand on those uh, bilateral relation, two street type, two way street type of uh, relations. But certainly, certainly this war does not only shed light on the commonality of interest as is customary among best friends and best allies, there are also disagreements. And this has been part of the US-Israel saga going back to 1948 with pressure exerted on Israel by presidents, with pressure exerted on Israel by the State Department, and this war is not, is not different. And certainly, we have a major disagreement with regard to the proposed Palestinian state. And just in a very uh, concise manner, and as I said before, in the tradition of Yeshurun, uh, talking straight, speaking uh, straight, there is a difference here. The difference is that the State Department can afford, can afford to dwell on alternative reality when proposing a Palestinian state as a solution, alternative reality, because the reality does not lend credence to such a proposal if one examines the reality of Palestinian track record, not vis-a-vis -vis Israel, but vis-a-vis -vis fellow Arabs. And that has led, by the way, the Arab countries to shower Palestinians with a very embracing talk. But the Arab walk towards the Palestinian has been anywhere between indifferent and very negative. And the question is, how come such a major, major discrepancy between the attitude of the State Department towards the idea of a Palestinian state, which has been uh, uh, embraced by the State Department for decades now, and then the Arab countries, which do not flex 
any military muscle on behalf of the Palestinians, hardly financial muscle, and they uh, allow themselves to stick only to talk. And the reason for that, again, has to do with Middle East reality, not with alternative reality. And the Middle East reality of the Palestinian track record in the intra-Arab sphere has been very clear to every single Arab leader in the Middle East. In the 1950s, the Palestinian leadership was hosted by Egypt, but within few years, they collaborated with the Muslim Brotherhood, terrorizing their host regime, which forced the Palestinian leadership to run away from Egypt to Syria. And Syria allowed them to terrorize Israel, but within a few years, they joined forces with the Muslim Brotherhood of Syria, terrorizing their host country, and they had to run away to Jordan. And in Jordan, they were allowed to terrorize Israel until September 1970, when they attempted to topple their host regime, which triggered a civil war known as Black September, and they had to run away to Lebanon. They plundered Lebanon for the first five years, and then tried to take over the control of Beirut, which triggered series of civil wars in Lebanon until PLO leadership was expelled from Lebanon in 1982. And then came the great betrayal, treachery by the Palestinians of Arab hosts when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait in August of 1990. At that time, Kuwait was the most generous Arab host of Palestinians, allowing 400,000 Palestinians, who were all of them were allies, relatives, associates of Arafat and Mahmoud Abbas, but it was that Palestinian group in Kuwait which collaborated with Saddam Hussein's invasion and plunder of Kuwait, and therefore, upon resuming power in Kuwait, Sheikh Sabah, the leader of Kuwait, expelled almost all 400,000 Palestinians. Arab leaders are not impressed by Palestinian diplomatic statements, by Palestinian interviews with NBC and CNN and Fox and other media outlets. They are interested in the Palestinian walk, not in the Palestinian talk. And therefore, they do not want a Palestinian state. They are not going to say it but their action reflect that attitude. And just one recent example, uh, the Saudis hosted an uh, Arab summit in Saudi Arabia on November 11, at the height of the war. During that summit, the Palestinians, along with Iran and Algeria, offered a resolution to desist immediately from any diplomatic, touristic, economic, and defense relations with Israel. That resolution was defeated by Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Morocco, Egypt, and Jordan. And the question is, why would they do that? It was an opportunity to advance the cause of a Palestinian state, but that's the last thing they want to see in the, uh, in the Middle East, because should there be a Palestinian state, they know it would take a very short time before it would cause upheaval in neighboring Jordan, where there is 70% Palestinian and a history of conflicts between Palestinians and the Hashemite ruling family that would trans transform Jordan into a chaotic state with multitude of terror organizations fighting one against the other, with ripple effects southward into the Arabian Peninsula, haunting every single pro-American oil-producing Arab regime. And the Saudis and the Emiratis and Bahrainis do not wish 
to bring upon themselves such a, a reality, and therefore they are praying for an Israeli successful campaign against Hamas, namely obliterating Hamas. They don't want to see a Palestinian state. They want to see deterrence against Palestinian terrorism as well as any other form of Islamic uh, terrorism. Uh, as I said before, much more about the U.S.-Israel mutually beneficial two-way street. I hope to share with you later on during uh, dinner time, but the bottom line of whatever I said was that it's nothing new to have a conflict between the two administrations. The fact is there's always been pressure by the U.S. on Israel since 1948, occasionally pro, uh, supply of combat aircraft was suspended, defense agreements were suspended, sometimes protection of Israel by the U.S. in the Security Council in the U.S. was suspended as well. But from 1948 through today, while the pressure has been going on, the cooperation between the two countries has surged to heights which even the most optimistic observer 75 years ago, 60 years ago, 20 or 10 years ago could not have expected. And it has to do with the unique qualities of the Jewish state, military qualities, technological, scientific, educational qualities, as well as, as well as the reality of the U.S. in the Middle East devoid of any effective ally other than Israel. Not NATO and not any Arab country can fill the void left by the U.S. when it gradually withdraws from the Middle East while extending the strategic arm of the U.S. without requiring a single additional American soldier there. The FBI director understands that. The leaders of the American armed forces understand that. One day the State Department will get it as well. Thank you very much. Well, for those of you who've never heard Yoram, you now get an idea of how brilliant he is and how much information he has and how much passion he has for our Jewish homeland. And what an honor it is to have you with us this evening and to see so many of you here. Yoram will be speaking again for our Shabbat dinner tonight for those who have reservations. And then tomorrow, we're all invited to join for a Shabbat lunch beginning at 11.30 a.m. where we join with our friends in the J.B. Greenfield Chapel and the Museum Minion and listen to Yoram again over Shabbat lunch as we'll be speaking about the myth of the Arab demographic time bomb. So an opportunity to hear him again and to ask questions and to learn from someone who has such an impressive record and such strong ties with the state of Texas. So we know, please know Yoram, when you go back to Israel, that those of us here in Houston will continue to cherish our friendship with you and continue to stand in pride for the state of Israel. And as we do on most Friday nights now, let us rise for Hatikvah.